funny enough, the uh, first, first week's matchup is Travis against, you know, obviously yeah. the Ravens sure. defense because he went crazy last year. So it was cool, man, just to listen to how his brain works. Yeah. His brain works so so differently. Hey. My man, how you doing, man? Good to see you as well, Everything's brother. Well? Everything's blessed, man. Nobody shut down Travis better than the Patriots. I'll tell you that right now. We tried to shut you down, too, but we couldn't do it. Couldn't get it. You got me a couldn't few get times. It done. No, we, we couldn't. I, mean, I always hard. hated playing you guys. We still got to watch the the nose and everything. We went into every game with you, yeah. and I said, "What did I say?" Yeah. Cover, cover them up. Cover them up. <laughs> I'm in. You want to do it? Good to see you. We're here. No, how you doing, good man? Good to see you, man. Yes, sir, man. By the way, his favorite story. Yeah, his favorite <laughs> story, <laughs> yeah, his favorite <laughs> story <laughs> about you. Yes, sir. Is the yes, sir. Matt Light story. His, that's his favorite story. He told it already. He told it. He told it already, dog. You deserve to be beat up, though. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, why I wanted to see if, what happened. If you happened. ever yeah. said that to me, like, if you ever said what you said to that man to me, I'm fighting you that's too, bro. That's why I wanted to see what happened. Now we got to fight. <laughs> I would get on the scale, and I'd be like, okay, please be over 290. And I'll know what time I think. All right, man, I'm good mentally today. <laughs> hey, that's the thing, too. If you go into the game light, though, you, yeah. you got a whole different mindset. I'm cramming water, all the yeah. power bars I can. I'm like, okay, I got to add two pounds before this game. Uh, like uh, when Zach Thomas used to weigh, weigh in in height preseason, yeah. he wouldn't stop moving. He'd step on the scale, step off, and say 220. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the height thing, he just walked past yeah, and say 5'11". Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter. He was going to make 20 tackles a game either way. It's monster. Oh, it did not matter, bro. Him, he stole 100 tackles from me. <laughs> he owed me some money. <laughs> That's my gap, Zach. Stop. <laughs> you ready to roll, no, brother? No. Let's do it. Let's get it, man. So Come we can on, get you back home. Hey, man, can we start the show? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, saying, you know. Stop being so popular, dog. <laughs> Your daughter's got a favorite uh, Taylor song? So right now, I've been listening a lot to the uh, I Can Do It With A Broken Ooh. Heart, the new uh, one. Yeah. And uh, Ellie right now, there's a, there's a line in that where I'm a real tough kid, I can handle my shit. Mm. And Ellie's three years old, and she says, I'm a real tough kid, I can handle my stuff. <laughs> and it's, that's all I hear on I a daily it. basis, because it gets I a laugh out it. of me every time. I know, I can imagine. <laughs> Hold up. Limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, How we doing? Good, brother. Good, What's happening? Man. Real good. Oh, I don't know. Just kind of rolling, getting ready for Monday night. I'm excited, nervous too. Yeah, you ain't got to be nervous. I'm just. I think you're. I think you're always nervous until you actually do something, right? I don't know. Were yeah. you? I mean, were I mean, you nervous? If, if it if it matters to you, yes. If if it matters to you, I think you. I think you're nervous. Um, when I host now, I'm nervous. I'm Still. not. Yeah, but as an analyst, eventually it kind of goes away. Yeah, it's definitely an easier job on the analyst. Yeah. All right, my turn to talk. Lay it on me, Scott. Like, yeah. Easy. <laughs> Easy. I can do that. And too, like, Facilitate yeah. everything. You're more kind of going with the flow of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You took on more jobs after football. You're not lying. Why? I can't not be busy, otherwise I'll go crazy. I need something to do and something to strive for. I think that that's like something that I need just psychologically. And there's a lot of opportunities, and you don't know how many, how long those opportunities are going to be there. You can sit things out and, and still go back and do them. And I think you, you want to capitalize on the moment and in the, in the, you know, momentum that's been built up. But at the same time, you know, we are retired and trying, I'm trying to spend more time with the family and the kids. So that's the tightrope I'm walking right now. Well, the voice you hear and the face I'm sure everybody is familiar with is Jason Kelsey. Super Bowl champion Jason Kelsey, six-time All-Pro Jason Kelsey, seven-time Pro Bowler Jason Kelsey, media darling Jason Kelsey, fair. smaller belly <laughs> now. J Jason Kelsey. <laughs> this is Fred Taylor, Shannon Crowder. I'm Ryan Clark. Welcome to The Pivot, a part of Fanatics and Pivot fam. Thank you for pivoting with us. I mean, you kind of got into it already, Jay, and yeah. you have created these amazing opportunities for yourself. 
you had been a great football player for 11 years, a Hall of Fame level football players. But it does seem like the last two years of your career, there was this meteoric rise in celebrity. And now we see you everywhere. You're working. I work with you at ESPN. We're just parading you around. You're our new toy, yeah. right? Like you've gotten me indoors and at dinners that I've never been in. I've been Stop. there for a decade. <laughs> Come on, bro. But for you, how, how are you, though, handling the juggling of this new life now? Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of trying to not do much different, if I'm being honest. And it's hard. You know, I think uh, there's a lot of advantages and a lot of benefits. And the last two years have been very, uh, you know, it's been a very quick climb to the, where it's at now. And I've always been appreciated in Philadelphia where I played, like I've always had like people walk around. I've always been an offensive lineman that people know, which is rare for offensive linemen. Uh, so I've always been appreciated in this city, but now it's much more on a national scale. And part of that's obviously because of the show with Travis and I. The first year we started it, we both go to the Super Bowl. We're playing each other in the Super Bowl. My mom's in the Super Bowl. That took it off. And then obviously uh, you continue it on so it builds another year of momentum. My brother's love life brings another set of fan base and, and people interested in our lives. So it is at a higher um, uh, level than it's ever been, and it's happened very quickly. And um, it's opened a lot of doors, like we were just talking about. Like There's a lot of opportunities to do things. For me, I don't really try to do that much different. I try to just keep living my life, really stay grounded in my family and my kids and the things that I've been doing that have allowed me to be successful to this point. But you also try and see what is happening now and you know what sounds like something that's fun and creative and cool and something you'd like to do and you, you kind of roll with it as it goes. I like to say we're, we're not officially retired. I like yeah. to call it career change. Yeah. You know, I love what you're doing and I think you're going to be great at it because you know what it takes, okay. first and foremost. What retirement feels like is when you sit on your wallet yeah. and your hip starts to hurt, Yeah. that's what real retirement <laughs> feels like. You feel me? Uh, but you said something interesting. You said um, you don't know if you can stay away long enough because you don't know if you can get back to it. Yeah. Are you potentially thinking about coming back? Is that a sign? Because you look good. I feel good. I'm probably too light. Maybe if somebody wants me to tight end, I could come back. <laughs> um, you know, I I probably carried out two to three years longer than maybe. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this for a while. It's not like just retired on the spot. It was really hard to do the last two to three years with where my body's at mentally. And it became a point, especially this last year, it was very apparent my body is starting to shut down. Uh, you know, Wednesday practices, you know, we do this drill, uh, kind of prepare you for a bull rush. Not, not, it, you never want to go into a game without having to stop a bull rush at least once that week in practice. That's the way I'm like, I need to feel that, right. anchor down and feel that, that balance. And we always do this drill on, on Wednesdays, push-pull, guy grabs you by the shoulder pads, pushes you, and you have to sit down, anchor your hips without your hands. And we would do it on Wednesdays. I'm, my hips don't work on Wednesdays anymore. <laughs> like, it just doesn't happen. And I'm like, this is not good. And it got to that point. And I think I probably, the reason I was able to get two to three years out was, you know, the league has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have to practice a lot on Wednesdays the last three years, really. They would give me a lot of reps off, which is very different than earlier in the career where you're doing all the reps in practice, all the walk-through things. They took those reps off of me and preserved me for the game, which allowed me to play at a high level and feel good still. But then now all of a sudden that's not working and I don't feel good. And I got to do more and more. And it's, it wears on you mentally, it wears on you physically. And it's, and that's why ultimately, you know, I don't think I could do another one. Um, and then also, uh, you know, I still ended playing at a good level. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stay longer and then get to a point where like now I'm committed to this, but I'm not the player that I enjoy right. yeah. playing the game. That's kind of, so no, I don't think I'm going to come back. Um, I, I just don't see 
that happening for multiple reasons now. You're going to owe some folks a lot of money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You go back for to sure. Play for sure. And I'm going to have to eat uh, tons of cheesesteaks to get back up to the right way. <laughs> right. Like, thinking about physically, like you, you feel when you can't, like you're saying, you can't pull as fast. You Correct. can't lanker down and all. It, it might not have been apparent watching the tape, but you as a player know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can feel it. Especially and you, on that and, high level. Yeah. And mean. like you, you feel it when you hit somebody. It's like, man, I just don't have. That that you know that pop that I had and it, it had been going down, but last year I think was a a significant moment where you're like, okay. And what about the mental side though? Because you said like the last couple years it took off new heights, took off, and then you had the show on Prime Video and all that. Yeah. Mentally, did that did that give you any kind of solace in knowing that okay, there's something after football because you played it since you were a kid. Your whole yeah. family, you're a football family. Yeah. The mental side of retirement. Well, I, I do think. Listen, anybody that has options outside of football is going to make it's going to be an easier decision to retire. Like Brandon Brooks, really good friend of mine, outstanding player, retired probably when he could have kept going, but he really knew that he wanted to, you know, go into grad school, go into Wharton, uh, and go into the finance sector. And that, he had a very clear vision of what he wanted to do at football. And I think that made the decision easier. Now, I still think he retired because he was done playing football, but that does make the decision easier. But I don't think. You know, I, I've really tried to limit it to, yeah, I know that once the football decision to retire is done, it's done. You know, the, the podcast stuff is, the opportunities that are there have, have are beneficial and it does make it easier, but I don't think that I retired because that's there, if that makes sense. I think I retired just because I don't, more because of the football side. You don't want the big basses. Joe Abbey. Pretty much. I'm tired of wrestling motherfuckers every single day. <laughs> <in my life. laughs> I'm tired. That's it. You know, you, uh, you wrestle now with your family. You yeah. Know, you mentioned being able to spend more time. I have a question, bro. Like, you're a handsome guy. You were in oh, wow. voted like one of the sexiest men on the planet. That was more like a joke. At, yeah. at one time. So it couldn't have been hard to, to date. You were in the NFL. I mean, you have that going for you. Bro, why the hell was you on Tinder? Uh, it was fun. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're – I'm young. <laughs> I'm single. Uh – you know, you're you're just having fun. I don't know. I lived in the city. I'd go out all the time. I mean, when you're young, you can go out. I can go to practice after being out till, you know, two, three in the morning and function just fine. So <laughs> I think, that, that 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 no longer lasts either. That's not no, a thing anymore. I, I remember. Yeah, I can't. I definitely can't do that. <laughs> and then I remember Brent Selleck uh, telling me one time, like he's like, man, I feel like crap. I ate this, I drank this milkshake last night. And I'm like, yeah, it's not the football that makes you feel like crap. It's the milkshake. What are you talking about, bro? <laughs> right. And then I ate some ice cream and then went out to practice the next day. I was like, oh, shit. I think Selleck was on to something. <laughs> like, I feel terrible today. <laughs> so, you, yeah, you find out that, you know, eventually you can't just eat and do whatever you want. But early in your career, you can. And um, I lived down in the city of Philadelphia, old city. Uh, and I'd, I'd walk around, go to different bars, restaurants, and swipe tender and try and have fun and... Um, it didn't last long because I met my wife, and then that was that. You, but you met your wife on Tinder. I did. And you fumbled the date. One of the best centers For sure. in the history of the game falls to sleep mm -hmm. on the woman of his dreams, a woman that he thought was so captivating, yes. he called for a second date. Yeah. How did you fall asleep on the date, and what was the call like? Like, say, boo, you know, like, I know we swiped on each other. And you came to meet me and the homies. Yeah. I poured up a little bit, but I would love to do it again. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so we met up after the Eagles holiday party from that year. So Jeffrey Lurie throws a Christmas party, holiday party every year. And we had already been tuned up from that party. <laughs> so we were going to the billiard spot, Buffalo Billiards in Old City, uh, afterwards. It's like, a, you know, just hang out and have fun. So we met up after all that. So I think she understood that this was something that was set in place long before we were even going to meet up and all this stuff was going to happen. So we agreed to go on a second date. And I was captivated with her, though. And I I don't, like, I feel like if uh, if she wouldn't have been at Buffalo Billiards, maybe I wouldn't have remembered Buffalo Billiards at all. <laughs> but somehow something I snapped out of it, and I still remember that moment still of her walking through that door. Um, I don't remember a lot from that night, but I remember that. And then um, apparently Bo Allen had to carry me home. 
But yeah, it was a uh, not the best first impression. <laughs> I'm just say this. I know Bo. Yeah. If Bo has to carry you, you yeah. in bad shape, for bro. For sure. And I think I was. He said I was fighting him every step of the way. Like <laughs> I was just like making it harder and harder for him, and we were dropping me. And uh, yeah, so. I don't know what how a tender works. Sure. But you were just swiping. What? Yeah. Why was that swipe different than the other swipes? Well, the first swipe, she was the most beautiful person I ever seen on the app. So that's why it was different right away. Mm. But then you start messaging and you start talking and you're vibing and you're like, oh, this girl's really cool. And then you, you meet in person the first night, not a lot of discussion, right? I'm in bad shape. <laughs> um, but then you, you keep, you know, we went out on a second date. Um, uh, went ice, ice skating, uh, you know, we, and then we just kept hanging out. And the more you talk in person, the more you really realize that there's a lot of like common uh, values and, 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 and principles and uh, the things that we both want out of life uh, are matching up. And that's when it really starts to be like, okay, I think she's really, really different, Is not she? just the other stuff. Do you open at some point with your shirtless body? Because I've seen you more without a shirt on than I ever wanted to in my life. You seem like you like to take your shirt off. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have been shirtless the first night. I don't remember, <laughs> but there's a decent chance. What is it, Bob's Billiards? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Buffalo Billiards, Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo Billiards. Billiards. I don't know that they would let me with the shirt off there, but um, yeah, I don't know at what point the shirt came off. I know, I don't even know if I should, I know I've like, uh, I embarrassed myself the second date too, because we're going ice skating and I'm tired of my skates and the moment I sit down, a fart squeeze out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not good. Not good, guys. And luckily, she laughed at that. And I was it like, okay. squeezed out. <laughs> we, we, we. Oh, and anything like that happens all the time. Like, I'm not like, I'm not like a, a, you know, a repetitive farter or whatever. I don't know, but um, I don't know. It was so embarrassing, and she laughed. I was like, all right, we're going to be fine. If she can laugh at that. We'll be good. Yeah, I, I think that's a really dope story, man. I, all of us in the NFL, right? We all have moments in our lives where we, we go hard. Like yeah. we were out partying, just having a good time, probably doing stuff excessively, as yeah. you mentioned, mm -hmm. try to get to practice and make it through. Yeah. But we always find that, that, that one person that yeah. sort of helps us slow down and changes it. Mm -hmm. We're all girl dads, yeah. right? So my daughter, she melted my heart, and that was the one thing that slowed me down. Absolutely. Right? Your wife, mm -hmm. how did she make you better? My wife, um, First of all, everything you just said, like when you're when, when you're on your own, everything you do, not everything, but a lot of what you do is just, you know, intrinsically what you want. And, and, and it's very much a lifestyle and you're going out and doing things that uh, that give you joy and give you satisfaction and give you purpose and, 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 and entertainment. Uh, what my wife did for me, and I think sports does this too, but nothing does it like a spouse is ultimately, you know, everything that you're doing comes under the lens of us both. And what am I doing to fulfill her? And what am I doing uh, to make her happy and to give her entertainment? So the moment, you know, what she's done for me has really caused me to look outside myself and to really focus on on that aspect, on, on how can I, you know, get the most, what's, what's the purpose of life and what's the purpose of a marriage? And, you know, I don't think it happens like consciously. Like I think you should look back and it's like, man, I'm like such a different person now than I was before I met Kylie. And that magnifies when you have children because, I mean, children are even... I mean, they would die if you weren't there. They'll yeah. just walk out and, you know, <laughs> drown. My daughter would drown in the pool if I wasn't sitting there with her. Like, she just walks in. Like, I'm like, you know you can't swim. Why are you walking in the pool? <laughs> um, I think that's the number one thing. Um, she's made me a more compassionate, a more empathetic, uh, a better person just in general. And that's carried over to everything else. You are not a meathead. And I think I, I, am. I, I say that because your all of your like pictures in every program or your pictures for each year, your headshots, it's like meathead pictures. It's like a progression of meatheadedness. <laughs> right? Yeah. But 
listening to you, there's so much depth. And I think that is, to me, one of the coolest parts of New Heights. It was you still had your fun. You still talked about ball. But it was people understanding how much depth you had. Yeah. And then there's like this joy that we always see, right? And I got to see an intensity, though, in you as you play, watching you on the sideline Monday Night Footballs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, dude, like, you're like defensive MVP in high school. You don't get a scholarship. You, yeah. you change positions. You're the 30th old lineman drafted. You tear your ACL, I think, in 13. Like, it seems like this total pageantry all the way to being named the king for your life, but it really wasn't that. <laughs> Yeah. When you were in like some of those situations, some of the adverse yeah. situations, what were the things you leaned on to get through those and continue to be, at least outwardly, what always seemed like a positive, upbeat dude? Well, you know, I think I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by really good people. And I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by people that believed in me, even when like circumstances and adversity and things start you make you start to question that. Um, in the NFL, I had Jeff Stoutland when I had a really bad year in 2016, and I've talked about this openly in my retirement speech and before. Um, it was a rough year for me, and I didn't know if I'd be back in Philly. I didn't know what was going to happen, and the one guy that like really believed that I could fix it was Stout. So that helps reinforce in my head, like, all right. At least this guy believes in me. And if he's believing in me, he's an expert off in the line coach. Like, he knows something. And I think I was very fortunate to have people that believed in me my whole life. I had, I had Stout in the NFL. I had Paul Longo uh, in college. I had Howard Mudd when I first got to the NFL when I was an undersized guy who had coached Jeff Saturday. I had my mother and father growing up. Um, I had high school coaches. I had a band teacher, Brett Baker. Like, it might seem stupid, but, like, the jazz ensemble and – Cleveland Heights was like a big deal, at least for the band kids. Like we would tour during spring break and battle other jazz bands. <laughs> and I'm a freshman, and they don't let freshmen into the jazz ensemble, but Mr. Baker like asked me to be in the jazz ensemble, right? So like there's it's a confidence builder, right? So I, I always had people that like for some reason had faith and, and, and belief in me. There's always been people that have also doubted me. And this is something that Jim Schwartz told me is like, the best predictor of success in the NFL is guys that are very self-aware. So, like, if you think you're the best thing ever and you're not, you ain't going to pan out. And if they think you're terrible and mm -hmm. you're not terrible, you're not going to pan out. It's the guys that, like, really know who they are and how good they are, where they're weak at, what they need to do to get better. And I think that I have always been able to, like, block out stuff that I think doesn't, offer any type of benefit to listen to, or like, hey, you know, I hear that, and it's like, oh, that guy's got a point. Maybe if I do this differently, I can correct that. Or like, I think I'm very good at like, navigating that noise, and that's helped me progress through the adversity through the years. You know, it's, I've been very self-aware throughout my career. Just coming up to RC's point, coming up you hear you were running back and linebacker. Yeah. Walk on to Cincinnati. Yes. Transition to O-line. Like, was it strategic? No. Was it God? Like, did you just you just started getting fatter? Like, no, Paul did Longo. Even well, it was strategic by Paul Longo. So we, I got very fortunate. I committed to uh, Cincinnati under Mark D'Antonio. Mark D'Antonio, first year, and I was a walk-on linebacker. I played for Pat Narduzzi, who's now at Pittsburgh, I think, still. Mm -hmm. And um, they called me Dick Buckus that year because I, I was like an old school. I couldn't, like... I couldn't fucking cover a pass to save my life. I'm just like, let me, where's my gap? I'm going to hit this thing like a missile. The starting center screaming like, Kelsey, I got a stinger. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, tackled the starting running back in like a scout team drill. Like, that's not supposed to happen. I'm just being ridiculous. But, so Mark leaves. Goes to Michigan State. And we hire a coach, Brian Kelly, who comes in. And they want to run a different offense. They want to run a more spread you know, you, 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 smaller offensive line, zone base. Before, it was all these big guys and power football. The strength coach you brought with him, Paul, had been a strength coach at Iowa, had been a strength coach at Central Michigan, and he was, he loved project guys. He loved taking guys that were li like borderline athletic at this position they were at and making them like a standout athleticism guy at a different position. Mm, wow. And he was very good at transforming guys. He did it with Joe Staley in San Francisco, same same uh, strength coach moved him. And um, 
I had never thought I was going to play offensive line, and I'm just sitting there doing a winter workout, trying to get a scholarship. Yeah. And Paul says, you know, I think you make a good center. And I'm like, ha, and I kind of laugh at him. I'm like, ha, ha, like, what are you, this is this dude talking about? <laughs> like, I'm not playing center. I'm, there's no chance. Like, I'm 230 pounds. What am I doing? I'm going to play center. And um, that spring, man, I played like f four days at linebacker. And of course, it's before you put the pads on, so I'm not looking good in the. <laughs> it's a lot of pass heavy yeah. offense. You're not the a seven early on day. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> the seven on seven's not going well. I'm tackling running backs and like one on ones just so they can't make it. Like, it's like, that's pass interference, Jason. I'm like, all right, I got you. Um, so they moved me, and I play pretty well. I was mad that they told me that like three days in. I'm like, dude, because I had put some weight on my freshman year. I was like 250 at one point over the winter because I'm not playing. I'm just drinking and eating a bunch of food. Lost a bunch of weight, went back down to 230. And then like, hey, we're going to move you to center. I was like, why couldn't you guys have told me this before I lost all this weight? <laughs> um, but I do well that spring. They say they want to keep me at center. And I don't remember if I was telling that, if I told this to Brian Kelly or Jeff Quinn, the offensive line coach. But they said, you know, we want to keep you at center. And I'm like, well, guys, I'm not going to just stay here, put on, you know, mm -hmm. 60 pounds for free. Like, I'll just go walk on somewhere else. So they said, well, we'll give you a scholarship uh, the next year. We can't do it this year because we're all, we have to wait till the next semester. Yeah. We're all booked up on scholarships. So this semester, we'll, we'll give you one the next semester if you agree to move. So. What is it about the uh, the sixth round of the draft? I mean, okay. Tom Brady, a Antonio Brown, yourself, <laughs> Tom Brady, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Terrell Davis. TD sixth round. TD sixth yeah. round. Yeah. Hall right. of Famer, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, and we don't know what AB is going to do, but he's definitely a Hall of Fame caliber player. <laughs> How, what what is it about the sixth round? How was your your the moments up to the draft and going through that entire process? Yeah, I, I didn't know where I was going to get picked. You know, I was I got. Um, I guess to rewind, you know, I was an undersized guy. I was already undersized, so I knew I was already eliminated from a number of teams' draft boards, probably just on the style of player I was. Mm -hmm. And to make matters worse, at the combine, I got appendicitis. I thought it was a stomach flu at the time, but it was actually appendicitis. So I'm literally in that big room in the, the, uh, the railroad or whatever with the train in there. I'm going meeting with coaches straight to the bathroom to puke or go out the other end. <laughs> Seriously, like all, the, and I'm like, dude, I don't, what is happening? And uh, I go out, for some reason I eat sushi. <laughs> <laughs> all comes up. Like just, I'm, yeah, I wasn't very smart back then. <laughs> um, so I weigh in at 280 pounds. And I'm like, dude, I might have just lost getting drafted. And uh, the next day, thankfully, I feel a little bit better. And it stopped coming out of both ends. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to run. I'm going to do it. Because this is the only way I'm going to salvage anything from this experience is at least go show them that I'm more athletic than all these guys. Mm. So I got out there, run, run well. Still not, I, I think I could have got better on my 40, but I do well. It's a good combine performance. And then four days after that or that next week, um, Happens, start happening again. This time I go to the emergency room and they're like, we got to do an emergency appendectomy. You're, you got a perforated appendix and we got to take that out. So I didn't know what was going to happen in the draft. Like wow. initially before all that, I'm like, man, I, th I think I can go like fourth round. Like I've seen where the other centers are. You know, I'm not going to go above Rodney Hudson and, and the bigger name guys, but I, I could sneak up into like, you know, third or fourth round. But after that experience, I'm like, I'm just kind of hoping I get drafted at this point. Like, I don't, like, it's it's a big question mark. And um, first day goes by, you're not even, you know, you're, you're still watching. You're like, maybe some, you know, no chance. Second day, uh, get through the third round, and I'm like, all right, we're hoping. And then as the rounds start going by, you get to the sixth. And, I mean, I really might not get drafted. I don't know. Like, the Chiefs were one of the teams that were interested in me, and they drafted Rodney Hudson early. St. Louis I don't know if they – they were the only other team besides the Eagles. Those are the three, like, official visits I had. So those are the three teams where I'm like, if I'm going to go somewhere, it's going to be here. The only other team that did anything with me is uh, New England worked me out as a fullback. Yeah. I'm watching the draft, and I see that the Eagles got two picks back-to-back, -back, and they had already taken two linemen. So I'm like, it might not work out for the Eagles. Like, how many interior linemen are they going to draft this year? 
luckily I get a call from 215 and it's Andy Reid. And, you know, right away, you know, he's telling me, you know, hey, we're, we got this next pick. We're going to pick you at this 191. Uh, has anything happened to you? You hurt? You, you getting any injuries or car accidents? I'm like, no, coach, I'm good. Everything's fine. And uh, he starts telling me who he's going to hand the phone. He's like, I'm going to hand the phone to the general manager, Harry Roseman. Then I'm going to hand it to the offensive coordinator, uh, Marty Morningwig. Then I'm going to hand it to um, the old line coach, Howard Mudd. And uh, he's like, you got that? And I was like, yeah, I got that. He's like, all right, what did I just say? And I'm like, coach, I don't <laughs> I don't know, because I mean, everything's processing so crazy. Right. Your dad's crying in front of you, because now it's been announced at this point, right. and I'm trying to process all this stuff. And Andy said, you know, well, you're going to have to do better. There's going to be like 70,000 people staring at you on game day. you got to keep your composure. <laughs> so I'm like, he's already testing me. But um, So that was that was draft day. Yeah, I, it's so much there that I can use to follow up. The one thing jumped out was the sushi. Yeah. It, br it brings me to an episode of New Heights that I was watching when you talked about the hot dog isn't a sandwich. And you were very passionate yes. in breaking down why a hot dog isn't it's a, not sandwich. a sandwich. Because I would take you more for a hot dog person and a burger person, not sushi, Jason. Uh, listen, I like all three. I like food in general. I'll, I'll get down with all of it. I'll, I'll eat, I've, I've eaten caviar uh, and bull testicles. So I'm, I go in a far, a far range of what I've consumed. Hold up, bull nuts. So I own 20 uh, cows in Southeast Missouri, uh, Cabo County. Uh, and uh, we have like a castration day at the farm, right? So I go down there and I'm gonna castrate my own animals because mm -hmm. that's my job, which is an experience in itself. Uh, and they had a fire going, and they're starting to put the testicles on the fire. And, I mean, I had to try one of them. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't. You actually didn't have to Correct. try them. You're right. Yeah, I that's like, and that's all too, though, man. Like, that's your animal. That's like naming your cow, like, meatball. Yeah. Because, you know, eventually. Yeah, we named one of them Kale. Yeah. Because we thought that's a funny uh, <laughs> juxtaposition. You. <laughs> We're eating oh. Kale here. Fanatic Sportsbook's $5 million jersey drop. Jerseys are dropping every single day. Just log in daily for your chance to win. It's time to suit up for season open. This is Fanatic Sportsbook, the most rewarding sportsbook. When we walked in today, uh, Bill Belichick yeah. is outside. And I'm always fascinated when greats get around each other. Obviously, many feel the greatest coach to have ever coached in the NFL and the accomplishments say so. Yeah. He says, every game we played against the Philadelphia Eagles, we game planned for you. Yeah. I told the coaches, make sure we have somebody right in front of him at the nose. If he tries to pull, mm -hmm. I want you to grab him. To hear the greatest coach of all time say, amongst all the players on the Philadelphia Eagles, the number one priority in the game plan was stopping Jason Kelsey. Mm -hmm. How does that feel? Uh, it feels good. No, I mean, I think, you know, to know that you're affecting the opposing team's game plan knows that you're an integral piece of what's making your offense successful. Um, and I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know how many offensive linemen were uh, game plan like that. I don't know. Zero. Zero? <laughs> Zero. Maybe. Zero. But, I mean, listen, I, that speaks to, one, I had a great strength there. I also, like, blocking a head up big nose guard probably wasn't my strength, especially if it was a, a, a man up, mano a mano, Vince, straight ahead block. Fork, yeah. and Vince. Yeah. Um, and I used to tell uh, Stout, I mean, can I still pull if he's head up? He's like, the guard can still go get him. Let me get out of here. <laughs> I'm the better match. We got Landon Digger. He's 360. Let him block this guy. <laughs> right. Let me go get this linebacker right here. But, no, it feels really, really good to, to, to know that you're respected in that way or that you're a perceived player of that caliber that you're one of the keys to stopping something the other team's doing. Jay, like, you know, you mentioned 2016. Yeah. You had already been to a Pro Bowl by then. Yes. I think you went, what, 14? I went in 2014. Yeah, you went in 2014. And I actually went, the, it's kind of, this is the way the Pro Bowl works too, and yeah. you know it. Like my, my, my year, I probably should have gone 2013. Mm -hmm. I was really good that year. 2014, I was okay, but I think I probably got in from the year before. Mm -hmm. 2016, I, I got into the Pro Bowl, and it was probably my worst season in the NFL. What was it about that season yeah. that, that made it so tough? You said you didn't play well, but it was Stout that believed in you that helped you sort of come out of that. What was it about that season that was different from all the rest yeah. when, I mean, it's at least public perception, and when I cut the film on, it was stellar play at the position. 
think it's, there's a few factors. One, we were going out of the no huddle Chip Kelly era, and I, we were going back to a huddle offense with Doug Peterson. And when you're in no huddle, it neutralizes a lot of the power that D linemen play with, right? So you're you're less worried about that, and you and I think over three years of doing that type of offense had just developed, quite frankly, bad technique because I didn't have to deal with bull rush. Like, when you're going on the ball over and over and over again, a D-lineman ain't bull rushing you. He's going to try and work an edge. and you, So you do different techniques, and I'm playing high with wide hands because it works for a guy trying to get on your edge, but it's not good for somebody coming right down the middle of you. So I think that was part of it. I think, too, it was just you know, a different offense. Um, it was a different system that I hadn't really ironed out yet. I had a lot of holding calls, in part because I was too out in front of the running back, so a linebacker could undercut me, right? And then when he undercuts me, I reach back, and that's a holding call, right? Uh, we're doing more uh, runs out of gun, so all of a sudden, with where the back's at, I can't go as far in this nose because I can overreach him. Mm -hmm. And then if I overreach him, then I'm holding him. You know, when, when the back's in dot, right under center, you, it's hard to overreach somebody. Like, he's already past that guy if, right. if, if he tries to back to you. So a lot of those things crept up. Um, and I think also I was just getting back into a, a heavier, stronger player that is needed in more of a traditional huddling offense. How much doubt did, did you have that you could get back to the play that sort of set you up to mm -hmm. be a pro bowler after trying to adjust yeah. to all those things. Was there ever a moment in your head, you was like, you know, man, I was a six round draft pick. You know, I, I have torn my ACL. You know, I am undersized. Yeah, the first two weeks I was like, what is this? So it's really, I say the 2016 season, really the, se the only games I'm upset with from that season are the first two. We got things fixed relatively quickly, but as you know, if you start off with a narrative and you struggle, it's gonna be bad. We played the Browns early on. Danny Shelton beat the crap out of me. I mean, I was playing with hands out here. I'm high. I'm not. I, I was. It was so. The technique was atrocious. When I go back and watch, I'm like, what the heck was I doing? Seriously, I'm like, why? Like, I'm playing a guy who outweighs me, and I'm letting him have my chest and get lower than me. What? Like, there's no strategy that that works in, right? Then we played the Chicago Bears. Uh, Akeem Hicks spikes long sticks one time, sends me back. I can't grab the ground. I still think I, I, I wore the wrong cleats. I, and after those two weeks, I get out of those cleats. Well, you're in that mode. You're like, bro, I got to fix these cleats. I got to get, I changed my helmet. I, I changed my helmet because I'm like, and this one's a little bit closer to my face. Maybe if I get out here. So I'm doing all of it, right? You're, you're, you're throwing everything there. It had nothing to do with you. It was like, it's. But Stout is like, dude, we got to, you. We're working all, all, all those two weeks after that. We really started focusing on, you know, get your hands underneath, get them inside, proper footwork, uh, be in a position to, to, to strike with power, all this stuff. So we, we're, we're doing all this stuff. And we played the Steelers the next week. And I actually think I played fucking really good against the Steelers. I don't think I'm, I'm balling. And I look at the, you know, you look at the grade afterwards, now the PFF's out and you're like, Man, I thought I played great, and these guys were saying I'm still shitty. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But after those two weeks, and then after that Steelers game, I settled into the new offense a lot better. Right. I was utilizing better technique. And then with a full offseason of doing that and continuing that with Stout, it took off the following season. And being a, honestly, Hall of Fame offensive lineman, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell people, people always ask me about transition to the league. What's the difference? They want me to bring up a receiver or a running back. Yeah. I bring up Jonathan Ogden and yeah. Steve Hutchinson and Will Shields and them linemen that do it. Do y'all have the same impact on the organization like those skill positions do? Do they would they come to you? You're you're the team leader. You're an all pro right now. Yeah. Do they come to you and ask you for your input on drafting, on signing free agents, on different things? All of it. Drafting, they'll limit like for me, you know, uh Landon Dickerson and and and, and Cam Jurgens and they'll like Stout will talk to my talk to me all the time in the offseason. I'm in here year round, I lift at the facility, so I'll pop up and be like, hey man, check this guy out, look at this guy, what do you think? Like, he reminds me of this guy, or this guy, this tackle reminds me of Jason Peters, like look at the way he moves. And so I love looking at stuff like that. Um, game plan wise, you know, I'm always talking to Stout or the offensive coordinator or the head coach about, you know, what's in, 
that I like, what's in that I don't like, and you do it in the right way, because there's going to be stuff that's in the game plan that you might not like, but you got to do it because it's part of the game plan. So you're always figuring all that out each week. So um, I've, I had probably more influence on all that stuff, especially later in my career than anybody else in the building outside of Jalen Hurts' quarterback always has the most say. Right. And that stuff's all fun. I love doing that. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's these other guys are the decision makers, yeah. right? Jay, I, um, I'm over here in the corner. I know RC called you handsome earlier, but I'm checking out your eyebrows, and I'm, I'm a little jealous. Mine isn't, a, they're not as full as yours. Yeah, okay. You and Travis got some really nice eyebrows. They're thick eyebrows, yep. You got some really nice eyebrows. How, how are you two most alike, and, and also how are you most different? Yeah. Well, I think we're probably different in, I guess, you know, fashion sense and, like, yeah, I think, I think style, pop culture, things like that we're a little bit different. But I think in most of the values that we uphold, like what we think is funny, what uh, we appreciate in people, how we try to connect with guys, the teammates we are, I think all that stuff is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So I remember talking to Malcolm Jenkins one time in the locker room, and uh, I think I'm talking like shoes or whatever. I'm like, I don't get why people were like infatuated with shoes. My brother loves shoes. I mean, you go into his closet, it's like this ceiling, Boxes stacked right. at the top, right? I'm, I, just, I just don't get it. Like, you're just walking on them. Like, what, what is the infatuation with them? And I was like, hey, man, everybody likes what they like. And I'm like, you know what? I guess that's all you really got to think. Like, people <laughs> like what they like yeah. for whatever reason. And I think, I think the materialism that we kind of differ in, uh, really, when you get down to the grassroots of, like, who we are as people, we're actually very similar. We might be a little bit different in the way we think. My brother thinks more like an artist, which might be why he's more into the fancier fashion and, and shoes and like he's into the style, dance and all of that. And I think of things probably a little bit more analytically uh, by nature. So I think that that also probably has a transition in what we like, but I think it's who we are as people and what we value and how we talk to people and connect with them and. Uh, and family, all that stuff is, is very similar. What, what's your most proud um, Big Brother moment? <sighs> My most proud Big Brother moment. I mean, there been a lot of them. He's been really good. <laughs> I do have um, a question while you're thinking about that. Sure. What was more emotional for you? Your draft day when you got the call or Trav's? Um, I think... It's more emotional watching, well, it's just different. Mm -hmm. it's, hard, it's a different emotion. What was the difference between the well, When you get drafted, it's very selfishly gratifying. It's like, I, I fucking did it. Like, I'm in the NFL. I've been wanting to be there all along. And your dreams are realized the moment that you're drafted. And you kind of know leading up to it, it's going to happen. But it don't change the fact that the moment it happens, it all hits like a lightning bolt right into you. When you're watching your brother do it, it's a much more... Uh, outwardly perspective, like happiness for him, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one is a, you know, an intense gratification selfishly, and the other one is an immense gratification for someone that you love and care about achieving their dreams. And it's a similar emotion, but it's different, and I guess in the way you process it. You know, draft day was one of them for Trav, back to your question, Fred. Like, you know, he had been through a lot in college, and he was a very, I mean, we all are. He was a very immature kid when he took over and got there. And to see how he had grown and persevered and got to that moment, I was very, very happy and proud for him then. And that was, you know, he was kicked out of the university at one point. He was kicked off the football team. He was in a wooden bat league because he doesn't know if he's ever going to play football again. And for that to transpire and for him to work to get back in the good graces of people and to rededicate himself in a more in a better way, that was a big moment where I was like very, very proud of, of him for for writing that ship. Because, I mean, you guys all know some guys, it doesn't work like that. They don't write it. And they have the talent. I mean, there's, it's crazy looking, like, there's more guys on my high school team that probably have more talent than me. Mm -hmm. I can think of, like, and I, I don't want to name names, you know what I mean? But like, th there's guys that are more talented than me and like decisions yep. and stuff like that. It just didn't pan out for them. And, but they had the tools. Like, they were, they were good. Um, and, there, and that happened in high school and in college. And 
uh, and in the NFL. You know, and speaking about your brother, and you talk about the differences, <laughs> you know, you were a Tinder guy. He was a reality show. Yeah, I don't know dated. if he did Tinder or not. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, you've been married. He dates pretty famously, <laughs> yeah. right? Because people like the person that he dates. It's also changed, it's changed both of your lives. Like you mentioned the, the two years of New Heights, the, sure. the perfect storm of two brothers play each other, this amazing family background, and we all get to watch it unfold at the Super Bowl. And then the next year, it's no matter who the Kansas City Chiefs are playing, there's gonna be a lot of attention on the suite. Yeah. A lot of those suites, you know, down the stretch of the playoffs, you're in, right? Yeah. A lot of those pitchers and venues now, when Taylor Swift sells out arenas, you're there. How has that microscope sort of made you think and have to deal with moving differently yeah. than you have before? Because you, you are such an authentic person. Yeah, I mean, I still try to be that authentic person. I think that that's important for me. Like, I don't want to go out there and, like, if I'm not being who I am and, 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 and my natural person, I'm not going to be happy with myself. It makes it difficult because everything you do is under a microscope. And everything you say is under a microscope. Mm -hmm. And people in the day and age that we live are going to tweet things. And any way you say it, they're going to find a context to make it controversial, to get clicks, and to do whatever with it. So you just know... And you have to be conscious of that. And, you know, to a certain extent, there's no way to prevent all of it. Because the microscope is there and because the attention is there and because of the nature of what social media is, you got to be careful a lot of the times in how you word things, which is unfortunate, but a natural thing with it. Um, and that's the way, I mean, you know that. You navigate that as a player. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to the media, you're finding a way to say this in a way that is respectful to everybody and, you know, you want it to come across in the right way. And now that kind of mentality, you're trying to be authentic, but you also want to make sure that it's received in the way you're trying to communicate it, not in the way somebody else wants to write an article about it. And Jason, I don't have a brother. I have two sisters. Sure. But I know my homeboys back when you were dating, mm -hmm. you call, hey, man, I got a bad one. Yeah. When Trav hit you and said, hey, big bro, I got a bad one. Oh, yeah. what's her name? Yeah, exactly. Taylor. <laughs> Who? 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 <laughs> shit. <laughs> 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 Did yeah. that conversation happen? Well, you know, it, 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 there was a lead up to it because there was the whole thing on the pod about him trying to get a friendship bracelet to her. So I knew that there was something. Yeah. But I think he was very cautious about uh, even telling me or anybody because, I mean, the, the reality is she is under such a microscope that, you know, I think that they wanted to make sure everything was done in a way that, uh, you know, was respectful to people's privacy. And I think they're still trying to do that. Yeah. And, like, even now, like, I want to be respectful of them. And I don't want anybody to feel like there's, like, a perceived, um, like, I'm violating some, t some type of private mm. relationship, right? Like, it's really not my place to speak on the relationship. But he is my brother, and I'm very happy for him. And, you know, you just have to be conscious of how you're saying things because it is under such a microscope. And did the, the business, the relationship... We all know what, you know, the relationship stuff, what's going on and the blowing up, the two years you spoke about, both of you spoke about. Is it affecting the brotherly relationship or is it, I'm going to say negatively, but just is it changing it? Well, not that aspect of it. I think the thing that's, that I, whenever you're in business with family, that is a dynamic, right? And now that it is such a big business, the, the podcast and everything. Oh, it's big. Yeah. Yeah. Now that that is Congratulations, there, by yes. the way. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Um, mm. It, <laughs> mm. <laughs> hey, man signed, man signed a podcast deal out the gate that gave him more money than he made being a Hall of Fame player. Yeah. Okay, we're allowed to bring it up then. Oh, okay, talk, open. Talking in my brother's basement. Yeah, talking with my brother in my basement. Um, <laughs> but then, just natures of that have, have caused a relationship shift with, we never had that before. Yeah. But thankfully, personally, Travis and I value who we are as brothers more than any of that. So at the end of the day, like all that other stuff falls under like who we are as people and who we are as brothers. Um, and certainly his love life, his family life and who he cares about falls above the business side of what we're doing. Right. So like, I think when the priority is that, uh, the other stuff, 
that you have to navigate as essentially business partners. Uh, you know, it, it, it comes with the right um, frame with it. I have a, some fun questions because that was right. that got heavy, right? Sorry. So here we go. Here's here's my. Who do we hate more? Which Patrick is worse? Okay. Dempsey or Mahomes? One, one sexiest man of the year when yeah. you were nominated. The other, won the Super Bowl you lost. Um, I, I, I mean this sincerely. I have zero hatred for either of them. <laughs> so I guess, which person do I love more? And I would say unquestionably, I don't know Patrick Dempsey, so I'm going to go Pat Mahomes. <laughs> what, what, what is it like, though, man? You know, because obviously he and your brother are extremely close. And it's, it's, it's rare, one, to have a brother that's in the league. But yeah. that relationship, now having other people that are parts of his life become close to you as well. I think you are a great player, yeah. right? I never got to know you. Sure. Right? And what, what I love about the job I do now is I'm going to sit next to Jason Kelsey and I'm gotcha. going to get to know Jason Kelsey and all the things I admired about him, I'm going to get to learn and connect to him in a different way. Yes. Right? A lot of times when you get an opportunity to do that, the player is done. Right? The player, gotcha. for me, the, it's over. I don't have that rivalry, but I also don't get to enjoy it real time. Yes. Whereas for you, you got to know Patrick. Not that you're friends, but you got to know him. But yeah. getting an opportunity... Like, even in this playoffs, when you're stepping away from it and you're getting to see that sort of greatness from somebody who you've now got to have a personal relationship like. Yes. In, in, in seeing him and watching him, what do you feel is special about Patrick Mahomes? Well, in, in watching him, what I think is special about him is a lot of things. Um, but I think uh, when I think of quarterbacks, usually there's two buckets. There's, like, the analytical, like very organized quarterback that's that's checking plays, fixing protections, and you know the Peyton Manning before the snap type quarterback that has had a lot of success. And there's, you know, the the very instinctual um, off the cuff player that can just go at any second. And I uh, played with Michael Vick early on in my career, and he's a guy that I would say represents that about as good as anybody. It's really rare to find a guy that can operate in both those realms. Because usually, if you're an analytical thinker, you think in terms of structure. And if you're an instinctual player, structure prevents you from being instinctual. What is so good about Pat, and I think what is so good about probably Pat and Travis, is that they both operate within structure, but they still somehow keep that instinctual creative mindset. and for a defense, how do you prepare for that? How do you how do you stop? You know, we know this play's coming. We think this play's coming out of this formation. And it is that play, and we got the perfect thing called. And then Pat and Travis do something different, and they're on the same page because they know, hey, it's they, they ran this coverage, and if I go here, there's a soft spot in the zone, and Pat just knows that Travis is going to know that, and he's going to dot him with the ball. And I don't know how you defend that. Mm -hmm. Because it ain't like it's, you know, you're defending a play. You're trying to defend a guy, two guys that are going to do something that you don't know what they're going to do. And so you get the benefit of the structure and the genius of Andy Reid and the offensive system. Uh, and you get two guys that somehow operate on that level. And in particular, Pat, how he does all that and still operates so freely yeah. is, is truly remarkable. Hey, man, I'm glad the summer is over. Kids always want to do stuff. They want to go to amusement parks. They want to have all this stuff to do. Hey, man, I've been working hard. I got financial goals to reach. But that's why it's cool that we got Chime.com. If you're going to have an overdraft, there's Spot Me. Fee-free overdraft up to $200. And if I want that direct deposit to hit a little early, I could get it two days before it's supposed to hit. But, Chan, I already know your favorite feature. So I got an overdraft. Now I got to pay a penalty. Chime don't want to take your money. They are a financial institution that wants to help out the community. That's why I love them. And then with Spot Me, your friends, they can watch out for you. Chime has spotted people over $20 billion. They want you to be financially successful. I like what both of y'all said, but what I like the most is, is no fees. No monthly fees, no overdraft fees, no foreign transaction fees, and over 60,000 ATMs that are fee-free. Chime, no fees? Come on, man. You can't beat that. And you can join millions of Chime members who are already working to be financially responsible. 
Live it up and progress towards your financial goals with Chime. All you got to do is go to Chime.com slash pivot and sign up for your account. And that's when the big bucks start rolling in. Or at least your friends can help you out. Open your account in minutes at Chime.com slash pivot. Chime feels like progress. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bank Corp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. Members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Boost are available to eligible Chime members enrolled in Spot Me and are subject to monthly limits. Terms and conditions apply. Go to Chime.com slash disclosures for details. And you brought up Andy. I was going to ask that because you were Andy in Philly. I was. And Andy's one of them dudes playing defense that you knew he's going to show something every yes. game you haven't seen before. Correct. And you just walked. Why is there three tight ends out here? Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. But speaking of Andy, I don't think he got the respect he deserved in Philly and all that stuff. Like, now people are talking about Andy with Pat and the Super Bowls on this side. Yeah. But how good is Andy Reid? And when you watch the offense now, even being on the other team, do you, do you, do you remember, the, oh, yeah, I know. I know this package. When I watch, but as you know, the team, the, the, the offenses evolve, right? They, 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 change, they change continually. Like, my brother and I were just talking about the behind-the-back pass, right? And we're talking about this week on the podcast, and I thought it was a naked in real time watching. I wasn't paying attention to the line and everything else. I just thought he was doing like a side mirror, like sometimes the tight end will come down, boom, quarterback rolls out, and he's kind of that safety package back inside. And we're sitting there, he's like, no, 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 this was – and he doesn't even have to say it. I watch it happen, and I know what play it was because we used to run the same thing with Doug, which is an inside zone read play with a rub route and the tight end goes to the flat. So I know what he's supposed to run. It's short yardage. They're hoping it's man coverage. And Trav is going to get the ball in the flat off the rub route. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So now that's, he was doing completely the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it really was out of spite. It, it was just off, off the cuff. And I think Pat was like, man, what's this dude doing over there? But <laughs> he didn't – I mean, that's who he wanted to probably throw the ball to in the flat. Right. Yeah, I would think. But So, yeah, I see some plays. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's that play. That's That's what we used to do here. And nowadays, so much of the offenses are, and defenses, like everybody kind of runs multiple systems now. Everybody's trying to steal from what has made the Shanahan offense go. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to steal with Andy's. Everybody's, it's a copycat league. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the four down, you know, five down or three down, like everybody runs, finds a way to get to that spacing and that structure Right, it might come like they might build a bear front with blitz and a nickel and spiking an end down on the guard and the and the nose going head up, but that's a bear front. Wow. They might they might find a way to line up in a four down and uh, get to a four four with the safety. You know what I mean? Like I think yeah, th they're finding ways to get to this spacing and in different personnel packages yeah. and. Everybody kind of steals from everybody. You have a Russell Crowe beautiful mind sort of thing going on here. Do I? Yeah, like when you when you talk about you talked about he's like you know yeah you get the guy stacked here but if you're in the queue and the backs in the queue like the the way you think about things I think it's it's part of what makes you such a great communicator mm -hmm. but it's also what makes you complex. Yeah. Uh, first time we actually got to spend some time together, you're drawing on a piece of paper. You're like, yeah, you can have the orchestra here, and if the orchestra's here, then you can have this, and he can play this song, and you pull your phone out, yeah. and you're like, yeah, this is the song I want him to play. Yeah. Like, you, you talked about your analytical brain and then Travis's sort of artistic brain, but I think mm -hmm. you sort of have both, right? Mm -hmm. What is the thing now? You said you need to wake up and have a goal, or you need to wake up with something yeah. to accomplish. Football, it's very clear what we're working to accomplish, and then the accolades come outside of that. Mm -hmm. What is Jason Kelsey waking up now to accomplish in retirement? I, I'm trying to continue to be the best at whatever I'm doing and be better than I was the day before, uh, whether it's podcasting, whether it's Monday Night Football, which hopefully we do a good job of that. Um, we will. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I... I I am always thinking of different ideas and creative things that sound fun and writing them down in my notes, um, trying to be the best father I can be. So I try to kind of, it's all over the place now. That's the one thing that's crazy, like not being, like with football, you, you, you realize once it's done, the structure and the constraint that it gives you, like bro, I just, had to, go, I just had to go to the, the facilities, work out, the food's there, the film's ready to go, like it is all done. Now, because it's so decentralized and everything is all over the place, 
you know, it's you have to do all the organization and trying to get it all squared away. And that is not a are you, skill how, how set. How are you handling me. this? I'm not good at that. I've never been good at that. Luckily, my wife is good at that, and I have an assistant, Emily. Shout out, Emily, that's very good at that. Thank you, Emily. Yes. For getting here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think uh, for that, I'm, I'm still getting used to that. But you, you put what the most important things are. So, you, you know, you know, husband and, and father first. Uh, you know, the, the podcast is, is a big piece. Monday Night Football is a big piece. And then, you know, what else do I want to do? You know, do I want to help, you know, with Stout in, in any type of capacity that I can? Do I want to, uh, uh, you know, be there for the guys in the line if they have any questions? So you're, you're trying to figure out, I guess, which ones are the most important, which ones you want to do, and how can I improve at each one of these? Would this improve your, your rank in the sibling, NFL sibling duo? Let's rank them. You, your guys finished second on my list yeah. in the siblings. Peyton Manning and Eli. Oh, that's fair. I had at it's one. Quarterbacks. Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey. That's still strong. I were, mean, second were two. is strong. What about uh, I had Sh Watts. I had the Watts. I mean, uh, the Watts got to be up there. I had the Watts at three. What about uh, Shannon and uh, Sterling? They were four for me. Four. And a, a sneaky one for me at five was the Barbers. Barbers? Ronda and Tiki. They're also twins, and yeah. I feel like that helps you – be at a higher place on the list. If you had to do the siblings. Yeah, that's fair. The, the, if you had to do the Not siblings. Not only the siblings, they look very similar. The, yes. the, yeah. Much more similar than you and Travis. Actually. Fair enough. If you had to do the sibling top five in the NFL, what All would it time? be? All time? All time. You got Matthews. I, I would probably put Peyton and Eli as, as one. Okay. I mean, they both, just from a hardware standpoint and Super Bowls and, let's face it, it's the quarterback position. There's a reason that they're paid the highest. That's... That is the hardest position to play. You guys are tied, by the way, in yeah. totals. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've won one, though. You know what I mean? We're getting a heavy helping here from Trav. Um, and neither of us have MVP awards or any of that. Like, um, I think after them, I think it's hard. I, I, I don't like rating myself in these ratings, so I, I'm probably going to abstain from putting Travis and I on there. After... Peyton and Eli, I'd probably go uh, Shannon and Sterling. Okay, that's two. After them, I'd probably go the Watt brothers. And the Watt brothers could very easily be number two very soon. I mean, TJ's been so dominant. He just is, he's just not as, hasn't had the, the career length yet. But, I mean, it, it, maybe they should be too because they're right up there. Sterling had a short career too. All right. Either way, two and three of them. Four, I might just go like the Matthews family. Yep. Because you Clay, got Clay Bruce, Sr., Clay yep. Jr., uh, uh, and then you got, um, oh, my gosh. I'm, Bruce. Bruce, thank yep. you. Um, so I probably go to Matthews, and then that's, are we doing Mount Rushmore that's top four. five? Maybe we know top five. Five, that's okay. Four. So five, I guess you got to go Tiki and Rondé. I'm trying to think of who what my, other my brothers. Honorable, my honorable mention was Marquise and Mike Pouncey, but Mike ended up getting hurt. I mean, they both had great careers while they were healthy. Marquise, uh, most decorated center from my time in the league. Mm -hmm. I mean, every year he made a Pro Bowl, which is kind of crazy yeah. when you think about it. Mike just had the hips, and mm -hmm. it didn't last for him, but he was a great player as well. Yeah. But I think from a star standpoint, Rondé and Tiki, and they had a similar thing where they, they didn't meet in the Super Bowl, but... They were both on really, really good teams in kind NFC. of at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd probably go with them. To take it a step further, you know, it's, um, it's about the last name. It's about the Kelsey from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Yes. Right? Do you ever have those moments where you just can sit back and think, like, legacy and how a pair of – you have an underdog in yourself, yeah. the hard work it took you to get to where you are. Uh, Travis going through those things, you know, getting the uh, Cincinnati situation, going through the troubles, and now where he is in life. Yeah. Do you ever have moments where you just sit back and kind of take it all, all in, say, "Damn, oh, we yeah. we really changed our 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 our, our last name, our um, our the, just the legacy of yeah. it." Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I think about it, um, that I thought about it as much as a legacy. Because that could change at any second, like, regardless. Like, but I don't think it's going to. But It's very rare. Yeah. I think, I think I think of it more as, like, it's just crazy that, you know, two brothers that grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, uh, 
at the house we grew up in that we it's, it's crazy to imagine that those kids that used to look up to you know Jim Tomey and the Cleveland Indians and Guardians now um, you know LeBron James and the Cavs and um, like all the guys that we used to watch uh, you know we watched the Browns leave as an organization and come back and I think it, it's nuts thinking back to us as kids and thinking now where we are like I don't think that that was really a you know a tangible thing it felt like at that time. And I don't know when it became tangible. Probably, for me at least, it started to become tangible when you start seeing like college teammates go to the NFL and you're like, all right, mm -hmm. I'm better than that guy. I can, I, I, might, <laughs> you know, I might be able to go. And I think, uh, I, I don't know when Tra Trav was, he always wanted to play basketball, but I don't know when it became apparent for him that football was gonna be the deal. But yeah, looking back for sure, it's crazy. It's it's nuts, and they, and as we said, like, it's also nuts just because I don't even think of myself as the best player on my high school team. Like I think of like, you know, we had a DN, uh, James Ingram, that was a beast and great dude. Um, we had um, we had a basketball team and a track team that were phenomenal. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of nuts even thinking back to that. Like it's like how did us two knuckleheads be the ones that right. ended up playing over a decade in the NFL. That's amazing. And my last one, and I know you got it, we'll wrap in a minute. RC does this thing where he usually cuts the room half. And because we didn't win the Super Bowl, so I've been bringing it up on a few episodes, but it's all okay. good. Okay. I'm, think, I'm thinking though. This is just I, the way I, it happened. I have a question though. Like, <laughs> it was, what's weird is, like you always say they didn't win a Super Bowl. I would be different if y'all participated in it. <laughs> well, well see, see what I mean? Just like. <laughs> Always showing out in front of company, <laughs> but no, right? So, and I'm sitting here just thinking because he does it a lot. Sure. But he hasn't really done it in a while, so I, yeah. I bring it up. The comparisons, you both played 13 years. You both won a Super Bowl and lost the Super Bowl. You both will be on Monday Night Football. Yes. He's a fashionista. Yes. He has amazing, beautiful suits. He told me, he told me at the, uh, the preseason game that we did, this is the worst dress you're going to see me. And I was like, that is like... You're looking sharp right now. Too. I don't know how you still step this up. But. Can we or will we see the Mummers costume on, <laughs> on, on Monday? Monday night? Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be on Monday. It's going to bring it off of Philly. I, I think that costume's got to be reserved for very, very like unique occasions. We'll see. I think I'm looking forward to Philly, and I don't know what I'm going to wear. Uh, but I think the Mummers, if that, that's got to be reserved for like. If not one occasion, something of that magnitude, not just a week two game. There's, there's very few things of that magnitude of that, of what you did that day. And I have a, I have a question, you know, for you. Listening to you talk about you and your brother yeah. and making it from that same house in, in Cleveland Heights. We have all of these people on the show who are the 1% of the 1% that often say what you said. This guy was better than me or I thought this other guy had a chance. When you really dive into it, if someone young was to ask you, well, Jason, tell me the difference. Tell me the difference between the guy that was more talented than you, mm -hmm. that we've never heard of, and now you, who is, without a doubt, the most popular center of his era mm -hmm. and a future Hall of Famer. What's the difference between it? Why were well, you able to make it? Listen, I think some of it is quite honestly, just a certain level of chance. And I know that people don't like hearing that, uh, but I was very, I don't know if I would have, if I would have gone to another college and not gone to Paul Longo, I don't know that anybody else would have moved me to center. And I don't know, I certainly wasn't moving myself to the center. So I don't know if any of this takes place without him becoming the strength coach of Cincinnati, which is kind of crazy. It's very crazy. So there's an element of luck that is inherently involved in it. I didn't have any catastrophic injuries. I didn't have a lot of things take place that could have derailed my success in the NFL. But at all times, I was still in a position to capitalize on the opportunities when they came my way. And what's that quote about luck? Like luck is when, uh, you know, uh, opportunity, opportunity meets, preparation. meets preparation. Thank you. That um, is so true. And I think I talked about it a little bit earlier with Jim Schwartz talking about self-awareness. Um, I really think highly successful people at all times uh, know who they are, where they're at, and 
what they need to fix to improve outcomes and to improve what they're trying to do. Um, And I think that I've always been very good at that. And I think as someone trying to be successful in anything, you need to know what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you're trying to improve on. And you need to have a concrete knowledge of who you are in order to overcome the different challenges and adversity that are going to strike inevitably in everybody's life. And hopefully nothing happens that is part of the bad luck. And then if you're in that mindset and um, and ready to strike, when the good luck comes, you'll be ready to capitalize on it. Jason, you brought up mummers because you, you dress and have the costumes and all that fun stuff. The Super Bowl's in New Orleans this year. Yeah, baby. Uh, KC that might th- be a good occasion to bring out a mummer suit. I, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it is very New Orleans-esque. If it is a KC three-peat, yeah. do we have a shirtless, beaded Jason Kelsey yeah, running I, around New Orleans? I don't know that there's a doubt in my mind that that's happening on <laughs> Urban Street. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we went to the Sugar Bowl uh, in college, uh, played the Gators in Tim Tebow's last game and got completely killed. Um, but Bourbon Street's a fun time. <laughs> Regardless of whether you lose or win, <laughs> Bourbon Street, everybody's a winner. Well, or a loser, however you look at it. <laughs> Is it true you ripped the sink out in college? I did. At a party? We had a football house, and um, it was a Halloween party. I think it was the Halloween party. And um, I had had too much to drink, which there's a theme here. This is not, <laughs> I promise I'm not, that is not my only side, but... Uh, a lot of crazy things do happen when you get, uh, unfortunately, very drunk, which uh, is fun sometimes, but not all the time. At some point, apparently, I was in the bathroom and, uh, yeah, I ripped the sink out of the wall. There's, there's, they don't really know how. They just came in, and there's water going all over the place, and, yeah. There's an alleged story, I don't know the statute of limitations, but of me throwing a keg a little inebriated. So yeah. it is what it is. You know, yeah. if the story's just laid out there, you know, it's history then. So, yeah, exactly. you, you two are kind of equally nasty, too. What's that? Because you, you peed and had to wipe your booty last time. You've taken your drawers off, flipped them inside a vent, and then yes. turned them inside out because you said that's like putting on a new pair of drawers. He dookied at a lady's house, in her house, and left it there, and... Dookie did a lady set. Oh, man, we're talking this story? Yeah. <laughs> that was not good. Uh, it was, probably I don't good. remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pass. That's, a, a, that's pass. a hell of an outcome. Yeah. 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 What happened? Yes. I was ah, don't don't tell him what happened. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Can you imagine getting that call? Say, bro, uh, I don't know, but before you left, yeah. did you poop in my house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, not just pooping the house. I pooped in the chair. <laughs> did you wait? Tell me, wait. Apparently, I did this. Apparently, and I don't remember doing this, but apparently, I walked up to a chair, lifted this up like it was like the toilet seat. Because <laughs> I thought, yeah, I ain't messing with you. Well, we do have a we do have a gift for you too from, okay. from Mitchell and Ness. Perfect. Right? It's uh, some get? new Philly stuff. So this is coming out in 2025. Here you go. It's the Mitchell and Ness hat. But this joint is a Philly crew neck. Oh, I like this. Philly, yep. So you are the first person to actually get that. Dude, I like this a lot. Yeah, and then you can wear it with your thong slippers. They, they, the thong, everything goes with the thong slippers. And I already told Suit. you, if this doesn't Suit. happen week one, bro, I have a total, I have an issue with you. How much do I need to be ready to move? That's my, the only time I don't wear sandals is if I'm, if I'm working, working out or if I need to actually walk and do a lot. Well, so we're gonna walk from the, the trailer to wherever we do the show. And it's gonna be in San Francisco too, so this will go well with your suit. Are we gonna do anything on the field though? It depends on that, if that's something you tell Marco you wanna do. If you're like, hey, we wanna do a demo, and I want to anchor down yeah, on Marcus do Spears. I guess I could just take my sandals off and do it. You barefoot. take your sandals off and do it. <laughs> do you have a place for quiet now though, bro? Like place for quiet? Just a place that you say, okay, hey, in when I have free time, right? Yes. Because the thing I know about becoming really busy is you start to have a level of guilt. At least I'm gonna say for me. Yeah. Right? Because I have this and I wanna give as much time as I can to this. And I right. have Monday night countdown. I wanna be the best I can be there. Yeah. But before all of that, I have to be a father. I have to be a husband. I have to do all of those things. And 
when you get involved in so many of these things, as you know, with football, when we talk about percentages of time, sometimes that's where you spend the least. So yeah. you try to be as present as possible. But even that takes a part of you. Is there ever a spot where you go, you know what? I need to just be here to breathe. I need to just be here to collect my thoughts. I need to try to figure out a way to be alone with myself a little bit mm -hmm. to at least feel some sort of wholeness there. Can you find that place now with some of the popularity, with all of the things you're doing, with taking care of family? Yeah, I mean, yes, I can. I mean, I am very busy, but there's still time to reflect and to get into like this like um, mindset and headspace to recollect where we're at and, and, to, and to, you know, figure out how, how we want to move forward in a way that's the best for everything or what we want to um, put as a priority. A lot of times for me that happens in the sauna. I got a sauna. I do it a lot. I go in there for 30 minutes and it's like a meditation session. I just sit there. I'm going, you know, and that happens almost always. Uh, kids are down at night. I, I got a good sauna too. I can put it on from my phone. It's outside. So I turn the sauna on, put the kids in the shower, read them a couple stories, and by the time that's done, hop in the sauna for 30 minutes, hop out, that's a night. It so, gotta, it's gotta suck to be like one of the coolest dudes in the world and be the second coolest parent in your house. Oh yeah, no doubt. But I, I remember- It's great, really. No, at your, golf, at your golf event, obviously I wasn't going to golf because I can't, I'm not very good. <laughs> And I had an opportunity to talk to Kylie, man. And I was like, man, you're much doper than him. No question. Can he, can you come work Monday yeah. night football? Sure. But now that she's back getting an opportunity, man, to do something she loves and coaching, how happy are you for her? Uh, and, coaching field hockey? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy for coaching field hockey. I'm happy for uh, in all these opportunities and stuff that are coming her way. And she, one of the things that is like abundantly clear about my wife and it's been that way from the moment I've met her. She is probably the most comfortable and confident person in who she is than I've ever met. Um, like, she don't sub subscribe to peer pressure. I can try and talk her into something. She ain't buying none of my bullshit. Like, <laughs> it don't work. And she is, she's just very, very good at believing what she believes, knowing what she knows, not in a stubborn way, although she can be stubborn sometimes. We all can. Like, I don't, so I think this whole thing in navigating this, uh, if there's one thing that keeps me grounded and, and, and keeps me knowledgeable of who I am, that, uh, you know, she's the anchor that anchors the whole thing. So I'm very fortunate that, that I have her in my life and that, I don't know, that I get to take advantage of somebody who is so supremely um, confident in who they are. So this is the moment where that I love the most uh, during the show. Okay. Your 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 biggest pivot. Yeah. Is is that one moment mm -hmm. that uh you can go back to or moments that mm -hmm. you can go back to and say without this happening I wouldn't be who I am today. Yeah, I think from a career standpoint, certainly, um, it is Paul Longo switching me to offensive line. I don't think there's any question. And there's been other people like Jeff Stoutland becoming my offensive line coach, a bunch of them. But that's the one that I don't know if I would have played in the NFL if he would have never been the offensive line coach for Cincinnati. But from a life standpoint, it's undoubtedly swiping right on Kylie Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. All right. Um, I don't think that anything. Uh, the professional stuff and the and the and the uh, all and everything else is is one thing, but I think the stuff that means the most and the stuff that carries over, regardless of what's happening from a professional standpoint, I would say swipe right on her. Love it. I love it, man. So, from our from our pivot fan, man, fam, thank you for pivoting with us. This has been dope. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you more than you know. I'm excited. Yeah, baby. To to do what we do, you know, we feel like. Uh, no shade thrown. We feel like we got an upgrade. Yeah, and we're ready we got to a work. Good crew. Yes, sir. Let's What's get that it. Fun? Money hey, green. Chan. <laughs> money, money green. I like money, that. Money green. I like that. I like that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hold up. Limitless. Biggest in the cap. Pinning it.
I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling got me up. Uh, on the mission got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cow pinning it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling got me up.